Hi, everybody. It's Professor Mitchell. We're continuing with Chapter 10. Almost done. Just one more section to go after this. Uh, this is Section 10.6 on Radical Equations and Problem Solving. Uh, this section is kind of near and dear to my heart because uh, many, many years ago, you can see the date at the bottom there, uh, I actually made my very first PowerPoint that I ever used to teach on this topic. Uh, I did it because I was being observed uh, by an administrator at the college that I was teaching at at the time. And uh, at that time, at least, administrators loved PowerPoints. This was before I used PowerPoint all the time. Uh, it took me a little while to get on the PowerPoint uh, bandwagon. Anyway, you can see Romeo and Gizmo there. Those are my two um, macaws. Uh, that picture was taken a long time ago. They are still uh, doing very well. Romeo is going actually to be 30 years old next month. Uh, Gizmo will be 29 a uh, month after that. Anyway, all right, so what are we doing in this section? We are solving equations that contain radical expressions, and then we're going to use the Pythagorean theorem to model problems. And uh, there are actually two SLOs that this section ties into, uh, the one that we've been doing for most of chapter 10 and also the one about applications. All right, so let's do it. All right, so how do you solve a radical equation? I still remember very uh, vividly when I was making this PowerPoint, I was typing up this slide and I started laughing and I'll tell you why I was laughing in a second. Uh, the steps to solving a radical equation are as follows. Step one is to isolate a radical on one side. Step two is to apply the appropriate power to eliminate the radical. And then if there is any radical left after steps one and two, uh, repeat those steps. Isolate a radical on one side, apply the appropriate power, to eliminate the radical. And then the solution will be easy to find once the radicals have been eliminated, because at that point, uh, your equation will probably be either linear or quadratic. And then very important, step five. Uh, normally, when we talk about how to solve an equation, we talk about doing a check. Radical equations absolutely must be checked. And I don't mean the sort of wimpy kind of check that we did with uh, rational equations in chapter seven. I mean, you actually have to plug the number into the equation and make sure the left side equals the right side, okay? Uh, there is a certain thing that can happen during one part of this process that will cause you to pick up extra solutions that don't actually work. All right, so the reason I was laughing when I was making this up is because I thought, well, this slide could sort of have two meanings. It could be about solving radical equations, but it could also be very useful to college administrators to like talk about getting rid of pesky, radical, loudmouth faculty. Um, that interpretation went over the administrator's head. He thought it was just about math. All right, so here are the examples. Uh, and as usual, I have these all written out on the tablet. So let's go over and work on those. All right. Uh, example one, on a scale from one to 10, as far as radical equations go, this is a one. I, 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 I don't know how I would make it any simpler than this. All right, so uh, let me review the steps with you. Step one is to isolate a radical on one side. So that means if you have a square root, cube root, that square root or cube root has to be by itself on one side of the equation. So that's already done. Step two, apply the appropriate power. So when it comes to square root, the appropriate power is two. So what that means is we're gonna take both sides of this equation and square them. So on one side, I'm gonna have the square root of x squared. On the other side, I'm gonna have four squared. All right, so this has come up in a couple of uh, different sections now. When you square the square root of x, you can kind of think of that as 
the square and the square root cancel each other out and just leave you x. And of course, four squared is 16. So it looks like we're done. So let's uh, do the check now. Check it in the original equation. So what we're asking ourselves now is, is the square root of 16 equal to four? Well, yes, of course it is. All right, so that works. Easy peasy, the solution is 16. All right, so let's look at example two. Example two has a cube root. The cube root of two X minus three add five equals two. So step one, isolate a radical. So this time the radical is not isolated. That plus five is in the way. <clears throat> so the very first thing we have to do is get rid of that plus five. So we're gonna subtract five on both sides and that's gonna give us the cube root of two X minus three equals negative three. So now the radical is isolated. So we go to step two, apply the appropriate power. This is a cube root. So the appropriate power is power three. All right, so here we have the cube root of two X minus three cubed equals negative three cubed. So once again, the cube and the cube root cancel each other out and just leave you two X minus three. And then what is the third power of negative three? It is negative 27, right? Okay, so radicals are all gone. The solution should be easy to find. Uh, and it is because that's just a linear equation. So we're gonna add three to both sides, which is gonna give us two X equals negative 24. Divide by two, you get X equals negative 12. So it looks like the solution is negative 12. Let's check that in the original equation. So on the left side, I have the cube root of two blank minus three plus five equals two. So I wanna know, does that work out when I put a negative 12 in the blank? Well, two times negative 12 is negative 24. Negative 24 minus three is negative 27. The cube root of negative 27 is negative three. And of course, negative three plus five is two. Woohoo! All right, so the solution of this equation is negative 12. All right, scale of one to 10, I'd give that one maybe a three. So what do the sevens and eights look like in this section? Well, they kind of look like this. So it's not that this problem is super hard, it's just that it's kind of long, all right? So you might wanna uh, buckle your seatbelt and here we go. Step one, isolate a radical. So notice I don't say isolate the radical because there could be more than one. So just isolate one of these radicals, I don't care which one. I think it's probably easiest to isolate the square root of two X plus five. All right, so that would give me square root of two X plus five equals one plus the square root of three X minus two. All right, so now that we've got a radical isolated, we're going to apply the appropriate power. And uh, because we're doing square root here, that would be second power. So I am going to square both sides. 
Okay, now part of this is easy, part of it is not so easy. The easy part is the left-hand side. Of course, this square and this square root will just cancel each other out. However, on the left side, I mean, on the right side, uh, we did an example like this a couple sections ago and uh, we had to foil it. Remember that? I'm not gonna drop that clip in here. Let's just do it. Uh, so I will write, just to make it a little easier for you to follow along, exactly what I'm doing here. Okay, so this is going to be F-O-I-L. Hopefully that'll all fit in there. One times one is one. One times the square root of three X minus two is square root of three X minus two. One times square root of three X minus two is another three X minus two. And then the square root of three X minus two times the square root of three X minus two is just three X minus two. All right, so let's clean this up a little bit. We have two X plus five. And then we have a one minus two uh, and we have the three X. So let's write that as three X minus one. One minus two is negative one, right? And then when I combine those two radicals together, the square root plus the square root is two times the square root. So that would be two square root three X minus two. Okay, so running through our list of steps. Step one, isolate a radical. Step two, apply the appropriate power. And then step three said, if there's any radical still there, you repeat steps one and two. So that's where we are now. I have to isolate this other radical, uh, which means get this 3x and this minus one out of here. So let's do minus 3x minus 3x. And then let's do plus one plus one. So that's going to give me negative x plus six equals two times the square root of 3x minus two. Okay, now I know it says isolate the radical. So you might think now I have to divide both sides by two. You don't really have to do that. And here's why. If I go ahead and apply my appropriate power, I'm not making the hand gesture because I've got something in both hands right now. <clears throat> let's look at what happens. Right, and I think I'm gonna have to go on to my next screen. So let's get that copied real quick. Okay, this was negative x plus six. And this was two times the square root of three x minus two. The reason that I don't have to get that two out of there is because when you square <clears throat> two times the square root of three x minus two, you're squaring a product. And we have uh, a property of exponents that says that just means squaring the two and squaring the square root, okay? Normally the reason that we isolate the radical is so that we don't create new radicals if we don't have to. This is not going to uh, create a new radical. It's actually going to eliminate the one that we have. It's just gonna give me four times three X minus two, no radical. Okay, and then on the left side, that's just squaring a binomial, you know, like we've, been doing since the beginning of the semester, and even before that, uh, that comes out to x squared minus 12x plus 36. So that's just a regular old foil. Uh, if you need to, pause the video and, and try to work that out, okay? All right, <clears throat> so we are finally down now to a quadratic equation. So you know what we do with quadratic equations, we write them in standard form. So I need to distribute this four 
x squared minus 12x plus 36 equals 12x minus 8. And now I got to get everything on one side, get zero on the other side. So that means we're going to do minus 12x minus 12x plus 8 plus 8 all right so x squared minus 24x plus 44 equals zero almost done okay so now we're going to solve that by factoring what two numbers add up to negative 24 and multiply to 44 well negative 22 and negative 2 right all right so that means Either x minus 22 is 0 or x minus 2 is 0. And that means x is 22 or x is 2. Ah, so are we done? Almost. We have to do the check. All right. So I need to grab my original equation. And I think I actually need to peek at it to make sure I remember what it said. OK, 2x plus 5, 3x minus 2. So this is going to be the check. Square root of 2x minus 5 minus the square root of 3x plus 2 equals 1. Let me double check that one more time. Yep. I Oops, nope, 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 nope. This is supposed to be a minus. That would have been a shame. And this is supposed to be a plus, my gosh. Okay, all right. So first possible solution, 22. If we do the square root of two times 22 plus five, minus the square root of three times 22 minus two. We wanna know if that equals one. Two times 22 plus five is 49. Three times 22 minus two is 64. Seven minus eight is not equal to one. So 22 is not a solution. It was a possible solution. It did not check out. So that one got picked up uh, during the solution process. And I remember saying this to you once before, I don't want to take the time to explain exactly why uh, these wannabe solutions get picked up. Uh, if you're curious to know, that would be a great discussion topic. You could you could do that as a muddy point on the uh, discussion, and I would be happy to explain it. Okay. All right. So let's see if I can squeeze uh, x equals two over here. That was another possible solution. Um, no, nope, that's not going to work. Okay. Square root of two times two plus five minus the square root of three times two minus two. I want to know, does that equal one? Two times two plus five is nine. Three times two minus two is four. Square root of nine is three. The square root of four is two. Three minus two does equal one. Woohoo! All right, so it turns out this equation has one solution only, and that solution is two, not 22. All right, so that was a workout. Okay, let's go back to presentation, because I think now, okay, so I've always left this in here. Uh, when I made my first PowerPoint, I didn't know what I was doing, so I made it from a template. And uh, I don't even know if they still make these. I think they do. So this uh, slide from the template said, real life, give an example or real life anecdote, sympathize with the audience's situation if appropriate. So the real life anecdote in math is a word problem. Sympathize with the audience's situation. Oh, I'm sorry, you have to do word problems. 
but that's where math gets used in real life. All right, if we never did any word problems, there really wouldn't be any point to doing math for most people. I'd probably still do it, um, but most people probably wouldn't. Okay, so an object is tossed from a high balcony. Find the distance the object has fallen when its speed reaches 80 feet per second. And we're going to use this equation, V equals eight times the square root of D, where V is the speed of the object and D is the distance. So if you strip away all the extra unnecessary words, what this problem is asking you to do is to find D when V equals 80 in the equation V equals eight times the square root of D. All right, so let's drop that 80 in for V. That gives us 80 equals eight times the square root of D. Now, if I wanted to, um, I could square both sides at this point. Uh, but I think what I am going to do this time, I didn't do it last time. Uh, I think I will get rid of that eight this time. The reason I did not do that the last time is because it would have created fractions. Uh, and this time it doesn't. So I think we might as well go ahead and do it. That gives us 10 equals the square root of D. And now if I apply the appropriate power, which of course is second power, that's going to give me 10 squared equals the square root of D squared. 10 squared is 100. The square root of D squared is just D. All right, so the answer to their question is the object has fallen one hundred feet. All right. <clears throat> what other uh, kinds of applications are there in this section? Well, there's Pythagorean theorem. So I strongly believe that everybody at some point in their mathematical journey uh, should see a proof of the Pythagorean theorem. The Pythagorean theorem seems like this sort of magical thing. It's this very nice equation. But where does it come from? Well, fun fact about the Pythagorean theorem, it was first discovered thousands of years ago by a Greek mathematician named Pythagoras. And since then, there have been over 100 different proofs discovered of the Pythagorean theorem. One of them was discovered by an American president, James Garfield, from the 19th century. Uh, what I'm about to show you is not James Garfield's proof. I don't know who discovered this proof. Okay, so let's uh, go back to the tablet. And this is sort of a geometric proof. <clears throat> uh, there we go. Okay, so what I'm going to do is calculate some areas. I'm going to look at the area of uh, the big square. And that big square is made up of, of a few different parts. It's made up of uh, four triangles and then a smaller square in the middle. Do you see that? Okay. So the big square uh, has a, a side length of A plus B. So the area of that square is A plus B squared. Okay, now let's talk about one of these triangles, say this one right here. You remember the area of a triangle is one half times the base times the height. Well, the base of this triangle is called B and the height of this triangle is called A. So that would be one half B times A. And remember, I have four of them. And I'm going to write it as one half AB instead of BA. 
And then finally, the small square has a side length of C. So the area of that uh, square is C squared. All right, so if you multiply out A plus B squared, you get A squared plus two AB plus B squared. And then four times one half is two, right? So this is two AB, this is C squared. And then look what happens when you subtract two AB from both sides of that. You get something that hopefully looks familiar, A squared plus B squared equals C squared, ta-da. And that's how you get the Pythagorean theorem. All right. So hopefully you've seen the Pythagorean theorem before. Uh, we cover it in pre-algebra, for example. Okay, so the tallest structure, here's a little trivia for you. If this ever comes up on Jeopardy and you're a contestant, I hope you'll think of me. The tallest structure in the US is a TV tower in Blanchard, North Dakota. Its height is 2,063 feet. A 2,382 foot length of wire is to be used as a guy wire attached to the top of the tower. Approximate to the nearest foot how far from the base of the tower the guy wire must be attached. So I have drawn a picture of that. And I warn you, I am not an artist. That might be your strength, it is not mine. Okay, but I think it gets the job done. Okay, I'm getting my calculator ready here. First thing I wanna do is uh, make a simpler picture out of this. Um, so let's just, uh, why don't we just do this? Okay, so we're 2,063 over here, we're 2,382 over there. And then uh, the bottom, why don't we call that X? Okay, so if you're doing Mitchell's commandments, you'd say let X equal the distance from the tower. the wire is attached. I really think that's a good habit to get into. Okay, so using the Pythagorean theorem, uh, leg squared plus leg squared equals hypotenuse squared. So it would be like uh, X squared plus 2,063 squared equals 2,382 squared. So let me go ahead and copy that on the next slide. Okay, and this is where I need my calculator. X squared plus, what is 2,063 squared? I have no idea. It is 4 million 255,969. And then 2,382 squared is 5,673,924. All right, so we need to subtract 4,255,969 on both sides. And that is going to give us X squared equals, you subtract those two numbers and you get 1,000,000 955. Okay. 
So what I'm about to use is maybe technically an example of what's called the square root property. We're going to learn about the square root property in chapter 11. So that's actually coming up pretty soon. Uh, for now, all you need to understand is that if x squared is 1,417,955, then that means x must be one, uh, the square root of 1,417,955, all right? And for now, I'm just gonna say, I know it has to be that because this is a word problem. Uh, when it's not a word problem, there will actually be two different things that X could be, uh, but in this word problem, it can only be this. And I think they said to round this to the nearest foot. So if I ask my calculator, what is the square root of that number to the nearest foot? It comes out to be about 1,191 feet. So using Mitchell's uh, second commandment, the distance that we were just talking about, I'm not gonna spell it all out again, is about 1,191 feet. All right, and that's gonna do it for section 10.6. We'll see you next time uh, when we do the last section of chapter 10, which is 10.7. See you then.